uh, theoretical uh, part of the of the course and uh, tomorrow we have a last uh, practical session and we will discuss community detection so first an introduction so community de detection aims at partitioning the nodes of the graph into a finite number of groups okay so the way we want to do that the idea is that we want to summarize the information about uh, the graph and so in this way we want to find classes of homogeneous nodes which means that we look for individuals with a similar behavior that's the general idea of clustering in statistics okay uh, we already saw in the last theoretical lecture the the last model that i showed you is the stochastic block model this helps you doing things like that in this lecture we're not going to that uh, path we are doing something else which will be a little bit more restrictive but is also interesting so there are several uh, types of groups that we could uh, look uh, for uh, and this goes with several uh, existing clustering methods so the clustering method is a, a way to find clusters or groups of nodes so here in this lecture, we will limit ourselves to the detection of communities. So there are people that call any kind of cluster communities, but in practice, a community is a specific type of cluster. It's a group of nodes that are strongly connected to each other and poorly connected to individuals in other groups. Okay, so a community is a speci special type of cluster. So more general groups can be considered with other techniques and in particular with the stochastic block model you don't assume that the clusters are communities. You can have communities but it's not necessary so you can have something more general. And here we will focus only on communities and we limit ourselves to uh, partitions which means that the groups that we are going to construct on the nodes, they have an empty intersection and they will cover all the nodes. There are uh, methods that will uh, do um, overlapping communities when you want to describe different uh, type of behaviors depending on different type of groups. This is not the, the case here. So we want to partition the set of nodes into communities which are groups of nodes that have a high within group probability of connection and a low between group probability of connection. So, what are the main uh, methods to do a uh, community uh, detection? There are a lot of uh, techniques around this, the idea of modularity. Modularity is a criterion that you can compute on a graph once you have defined a set of clusters on the nodes. And uh, with this criterion, you can try to maximize the criterion over all the possible clustering of the nodes. The problem with those approaches is that the maximization over all the possible clustering of the nodes, it's not something that you can do because the number of, uh, of partitions that you have uh, on uh, n nodes uh, in k groups, this is exponential in the number n. So this is too complicated. So if you want to work with modularity, there are methods that do approximate maximization of the modularity. And uh, the most well-known is the Newman-Girvan uh, Newman modularity criterion, which is the, the most, it's not the most general modularity, but it's the, the basic of the modularity. And then there are generalization of that, of that criterion. And to maximize that, uh, a well-known algorithm, uh, algorithm is uh, what is called the Louva algorithm. So the Louva algorithm is a fast way to maximize the modularity of a graph. So it finds you uh, a partition of the set of nodes uh, that are that render the the th that are mod that are communities. It gives you uh, um, communities on your uh, on your graph. Um, it's quite fast, it works on very large networks, so it has some advantages. One of the disadvantages is that it's quite unstable. So if you run it several times, you will find different partitions. 
So maybe you could monitor uh, the, uh, the value of the modularity to take the best of it, but it's highly uh, likely uh, that you will find different partitions with almost the same modularity. So it's not clear. Okay, so it, it has some disadvantages. Another type of techniques that you can use to do community detection on, in graphs is random walk methods. So the idea is that you take a node at random in the graph, and uh, at this point in the graph, you pick one of the neighbors at random with probability uh, uniform. Okay, so you will go to a neighbor of this initial node, and then you continue. And if your graph is organized into communities, that means, uh, let me take, Okay, so if your graph is organized into communities, that means that you have uh, like things like that. Okay, um, okay, imagine things like that. So these are my three different communities. If I start, at random here, uh, if this is a community, then I will stay for a long time in that cluster before I go to another cluster, and then I will stay in a, in a long time in that cluster, etc. So by just looking at the time you spend on a node, you can reconstruct the different communities. Okay, that's the idea of the of the community detection methods based on random walks. Um, you can use probabilistic methods like the stochastic block model or other um, models like the latent block model where you put on the, the latent space uh, model where you put clusters on top of it. Okay, that, I, I won't discuss that. And here we are going to focus on spectral clustering. So, the, the principle of spectral clustering, um, it's, um, it's interesting because it will go beyond the problem of clustering nodes in a graph, but we'll see that in a minute. Here, uh, oh no, sorry, <laughs> the slide is about modularity. I didn't open the slide before I came, huh? okay. So modularity, uh, I, maybe I already said that. We, we give ourselves a measure of the quality of a partition of the nodes, and we seek to optimize this quality measure, so that's the modularity criterion. And as the number of possible partitions is too large to be explored exhaustively, heuristics are necessary to find the optimum. So, for instance, the LUVA algorithm is one way to optimize the newman girvan modularity. Oh, ah, I, I, may, I put details, I forgot that. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at the, at the newman girvan uh, Modularity, this is quite simple. So the, the Q is the name of the criterion and C is a partition of the set of nodes into K classes. So you fix the graph and you consider one partition of the nodes into K classes. Then the modularity of this partition of the node is defined in that way. You consider a pair of nodes that are in the same cluster, okay? And then you count how many edges there are uh, between uh, such nodes, and you compare this with something that you already saw. This is the expected value of an edge under a configuration model, one where you have random degree model and you choose the normalizing constant to be equal to t twice the number, the total number of edges. Okay, so this measure. Uh, will tell you um, how far apart what you observed as the number of edges within a community uh, are far away from what you expect in a random degree model, which is a specific uh, configuration model. If this quantity is large, it means that the clusters that you have cho chosen here, the partition, they are modular. You have more edges within the group than expecting, expected at random under this, uh, this model. Okay, another way uh, to look, a, 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 G, a, a. that's the adjacency matrix. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's, zero. yeah, zero or one. So it can be negative numbers. Yeah. Uh, but in, in practice, uh, the, the modularities are, that you maximize, they are always positive. So you find clusters such that this quantity is positive and the highest. Um, so another way to, uh, to write uh, this, uh, this modularity uh, criterion is to see it as the number of uh, the sum over all the possible communities. Then you look at how many edges you have within that community um, divided by uh, twice the total number of edges and you compare this quantity with what you expect at random under the configuration model. So that really gives you the, um, the excess of edges that you obtain with that, clusters, with that clustering uh, compared to uh, what you expect on a null model. So, LUVA algorithm is the most famous one to optimize this, uh, this quantity, and it's, also, it's only a, a heuristic algorithm. It doesn't claim to find the optimal uh, maximum. Yeah, that's not possible to find the, the optimal maximum. Uh, you have in the R package uh, iGraph a function that does implement the loop algorithm, so you, you can test it. And uh, there are uh, variants of the uh, Louvain algorithm. This is to, supposed to be uh, faster than the classical uh, Louvain. I never tried it, but since it's uh, for me the, the most recent uh, references, uh, reference, I put it here. So as I already said, that's very unstable, that the partitions uh, vary a lot from one try to another one, and you have no guarantee uh, to reach the optimum value. Okay, methods based on random walks. Yeah. How do I compute the what? This is the, the degree, yeah, you take the empirical degree. Yeah, yeah, so you have a graph, you have the, the sequence of degrees, and you use the values observed to compute what you expect. So it's really like fixing the degrees and working on all the possible graphs that have exactly the same degree sequence. No. It's a theoretical model, and it used the information about what you observe. That's the idea of the configuration model. Other questions? No? Okay, let me go back here. So that he has to work. <laughs> um, okay, methods based on random walks. So, I already explained that. Uh, we let a walker uh, which starts from a node taken at random and which visits the graph by shooting each time. So that's the Google Translate thing. Yeah? So you, you draw uniformly, I'm sorry for that, you draw uniformly at random uh, a, a neighbor uh, of the current position. And then if the graph is organized into communities, the walker will spend a lot of time in the community and it will remain stuck in that community, and then after a while, it will go out and visit another community. So you look at, uh, at uh, the, the nodes visited, and in the order they are visited, and the, the time you spent uh, in each node. And by repeating the process, you then determine the subgroups of nodes which are strongly connected. Okay, now, we'll focus on spectral clustering. So as I already mentioned, uh, spectral clustering works beyond graphs. It's a general technique to do clustering of uh, vectors in a d-dimensional space. We'll see how it works. So, uh, so if you uh, have a, a classic data table, which, what I mean by, by a data table is just um, a classical data frame with individuals on which I measure d random variables, which are continuous, say, a quantitative uh, uh, data set. Uh, then uh, I can see all these individuals as points 
in a d-dimensional space represented by the variables I measured on them. And then uh, spectral clustering is an alternative to, for instance, the k-means algorithm, where you want to uh, put together the individuals that have the closest characteristics in RD. Okay? So you, you look at the individuals described uh, by a vector of dimension D, and the points that are the closest in the D-dimensional space, you want to put them together. So what's the link with, uh, no, not yet. Uh, so the characteristics of spectral clustering. It's a classification that is adapted to search for communities, and exclusively uh, communities normally. It's not based on a probabilistic model, but it has the advantage of working on very large graphs. Okay, so that's really nice. You can use graphs with millions of nodes. I think that works if you implement it correctly, but that's correctly implemented, working with uh, sparse matrices and etc. And uh, one of the problems is that it's a technique that is limited to undirected graphs. Uh, you cannot take into account the direction of the edge in the graph to, uh, to compute the community or to say something different uh, from the direction that you would say from the undirected information. But uh, your edges, they can be binary or valued. That's not a problem. You can generalize to, uh, to um, positive weights on the graph. Not anything but positive weights. Okay, so the construction of similarity graphs. So the idea is that if you start not with a graph, but with a classical data frame, you have n individuals described by p different random variables. And so you observe x1, xn, and each line, each row of your data frame xi has dimension p. It's a vector in Rp. So we want to do unsupervised classification. So we want to find clusters without anything uh, a priori. Just the idea that uh, the individuals that are described by similar values of uh, those p uh, uh, variates, they will be close, they will be in the same communities. So the usual technique to do that is, for instance, k-means. So everyone knows more or less k-means, OK? or hierarchical classification. But uh, anytime you use that, the idea is that you construct a similarity, which is a positive uh, value on each pair of relations. So here it's S, I, J, which will be inversely proportional to the distance. So the, the more the individuals I, J are close in that space, so the more xi and the xj are close in that space, the larger the similarity will be. Okay. So then you construct a graph with the set of nodes uh, that contains n entities, so n was the number of rows in your initial da data matrix, and you construct an edge between node i and node j if the similarity between xi and xj is greater than a certain threshold. So you have to choose a similarity, so a way to compute O similar two vectors in Rp r, and then you have to choose a threshold. So, uh, for instance, for binary graph, you will decide, okay, if my similarity is larger than this threshold S, then I put uh, an edge uh, in, uh, my, uh, in my graph. And if the similarity is uh, lower than the threshold, then I don't put the edge, the corresponding edge. So this is when I uh, construct a binary graph from this similarity. I can s also uh, do something less binary by constructing uh, a valued graph. So uh, I can construct a valued graph with SIG. If SIG uh, is larger than S, then I put the edge, and the edge will carry the value SIG. So if SIJ is really large, I don't always 
uh, characterize this as the edge being present. I can keep the information of how large the SIJ was. So in practice, there are, uh, otherwise the, the edge is not present. So most of the time we discard low values of the edges, of the, of the similarities, in order not to have a complete graph, okay, but it's up to you. But uh, most of the time, uh, if, you, if you put a complete graph and you, you keep all those values, you will add a lot of noise. So choosing a threshold is a way to remove part of the noise. Okay, so the link between data clustering and graph communities. So the problem of clustering points, you can reformulate it as a problem of partitioning the similarity graph, where we look for groups of nodes such that intra-group connections are large and <coughs> between groups connections are weak. So that really reflects the idea that the, the points in the RP space which are closed, they have a, a larger probability to get connected because their similarity will be large. So that's how we go, how we link the two, uh, the two problems. Okay, so there are different similarity graphs that you can construct. The first is a dense similarity graph. In this uh, setting, uh, the neighborhoods uh, in RP will define the similarity. So a common way to do so is to take the similarity as the exponential of minus the, the Euclidean distance between Xi and Xj. So here you have a parameter sigma that basically will tell you if you um, allow uh, to look at a larger distance, what is the, the weight that you put uh, two points at a larger distance. It plays the, a similar ro role as the window size uh, in, the, in, a, in a neighborhood um, uh, partitioning algorithm. Okay, so the, the larger, uh, the, the sigma, um, the, the larger, the, the most importance you will put on, on uh, points that are far away, and the smaller the sigma, the more you restrict to a uh, small distance. Okay, you, you, are, you get a high similarity only for points that are very close together. Okay, um, and you put, uh, you always need to put. Uh, a diagonal of zeros, okay? You choose to put a diagonal of zeros. So this graph, uh, it will be uh, valued and each edge is weighted by the value Sij. So in fact, it's a complete graph. All the edges are present and you keep the information how, how similar each pair of points, are, each pair of nodes are. Is that okay? So that's it's called a dense valued graph, so it's complete, so it's more than that, it's even complete. All the edges are present. So that's what I will call uh, below the dense similarity graph. Another type of graph that you can construct is the epsilon neighborhood graph. Here you set a threshold and you connect the nodes with, so, so you take the, the same um, similarity distance between the vector, the, the, the you, you take for instance the same similarity and you, uh, you cut it uh, for this uh, threshold and then you construct a binary graph, you remove the information about the similarity. So the epsilon neighborhood graph is just uh, looking at uh, the graph whose similarity is uh, above a threshold, so it exactly means that the distance is below another threshold. Then you can look at the key nearest neighbor graph. Here you start by defining what I call a, what is a, a directed graph. Here, if you fix one point, xj, uh, so no, sorry, you fix xi and you look at 
all the k nearest neighbor. So you fix the value of k, k is an integer, and you look at, say, the five nearest points to x uh, i. So that means that if xj is one of the k nearest neighbor to xi, uh, or uh, so that means that the distance between a i j is among the k smallest elements d i l for l not equal to i, or if s i j is among the k largest elements of the same thing, then we create an edge, and this is oriented. Because if you are among my five nearest neighbors, that doesn't mean that I am among your five nearest neighbors. You agree with that? It's completely dissymmetric. So by this uh, construction, you have something that is uh, directed. But I told you that spectral clustering methods, they cannot uh, work on directed graphs, so you have to remove the directions and then there are two different ways you could uh, think of doing that. The first way is that you put an edge uh, in the graph as soon as j is among the k nearest neighbors of i or i is among the k nearest neighbors of j. That's one of the possibilities. The second possibility is to use an end rule. So you put an edge in the graph as soon as j is among the k nearest neighbors of i and i is among the k nearest neighbor of j. So by applying either the or and the uh, or the and rule, you construct a graph that is directed and at the very end of this process, uh, you give the weights saj uh, to uh, the, the edges that you have constructed and the the SAJ are still symmetric, so you, you don't have any problem there. It's still something related to inversely proportional to the distance. So, and then you construct the value graph. And here, um, so depending on, on, on the way you, uh, you construct uh, the, the resulting graph, but the number of neighbors will be, say, less than K, okay? Because you have, uh, you have uh, looked at only uh, the k uh, nearest neighbors. So it's not a dense graph at all. You control for the number, uh, the degree of the graph. So, remarks. The, the graph of the key nearest neighbors is a sort of compromise between the dense graph, where you have all the edges, and the graph of the epsilon neighborhood, because when you threshold in the epsilon neighborhood graph, the thresholding step reduces the, the noise, but you keep the values uh, of the most SIJs, uh, uh, the edges that are large. So here um, we threshold because we, we have a limited degree, but we keep the SIJ and in the epsilon neighborhood, we, w we went to a binary graph. So we didn't keep the value of the SIJ. So it's a compromise, okay? The choice of the similarity graph between the vectors will influence the result of the partitioning that we get. Uh, and there's no way uh, which choice is better a priori. So that's one of the things we will experiment in the class, uh, in the practical class today. You will test different uh, construction of similarity graphs and do the clustering with those different uh, graphs and you'll see that you obtain different clusters on the initial set of nodes, or initial set of points, yes. we are not nodes. So, in what follows, we have a graph, either binary or valued, and it's not constructed, so we forget about this, uh, these constructions, and it defines the relationships between our entities, and now we are entering into what is exactly spectral clustering on a graph. But remember, spectral clustering can be used on something which is not a graph at the beginning. Okay. So, to do spectral clustering, we have to define uh, Laplacian ma matrices of graphs, and you will see that there are different definitions. So, it's a bit boring, but I try to show you that um, there are some uh, variants, and uh, the variants will have an impact on the results, 
and it's unclear uh, which uh, which method would be the best. So I show you uh, what are the possibilities. Okay. So when you have G, which is an undirected valued graph, if it's not valued, uh, it's binary, but you can say the, the value is, uh, is one, okay? So the weight could be one. So um, A uh, in what follows will be uh, the value that just sensi matrix. So if it's binary, it's just zero, one, but otherwise you have zero values and uh, positive values. So that's one of the constraints. You assume that uh, these entries of that matrix, they are positive. So in some sense, these are similarities. So this can be zero or one, or this can be zero or weights, but the weight should be positive. So undirected uh, graph, so that A is symmetric with positive entries. So now uh, you introduce also uh, D, which is the diagonal matrix that contains uh, the values of the degrees, D1 up to Dn. So D is just the diagonal of D1 up to Dn. So D, Di is a valued degree. So I define it as the sum over uh, the rows uh, or the columns of my matrix as the entries. But here these are uh, similarities. So when I sum this, this is a valued degree. Okay, not, not counting only the number of neighbors, it's uh, putting a weight on each neighbor. So there are several definitions of the Laplacian matrix. And the interest in the Laplacian matrix lies in the properties of, the, of their spectrum. So the, the spectrum of a matrix is just the set of, va of eigenvalues, should be eigenvalues, I will correct that, eigenvalues and eigen, uh, associated eigenvectors. So here are the definitions. There are at, in this class, I will discuss three different definitions of the Laplacian matrices. And the idea is basically that you take the, the original matrix A, the adjacency matrix, and you have some transformation that will normalize them in some sense. So there are different ways of normalizing them. The, the, the first simplest way is just you take the matrix and you consider D minus A. So here you are just taking, so that's the diagonal uh, matrix with all the degrees, so the sum of the lines, and you remove it from A. So here this matrix that you construct, it's just a matrix with the sum of the rows which is equal to zero. So it's a, it's a, I call it a non-normalized, but it's already centered in some sense, okay? <coughs> it's not exactly a centering, but let's imagine it like that. Another uh, Laplacian is the normalized one. Here you take this one and you uh, do D minus one half this uh, quantity d minus one half. So d minus one half is just the diagonal matrix with the values one over square root of di. Okay, nothing uh, fancy. When you recompute it, that's dit, dit, that quantity, the identity matrix minus this normalization of uh, the adjacency matrix A. And the last uh, Laplacian that has been introduced, I call it the absolute Laplacian. And uh, it's not uh, centering uh, the original uh, matrix, but it only takes uh, the matrix A and you multiply it by D minus one on the left and by D minus one on, on the right. And so you can see that it's the same as, the, as this one, but uh, it's identity minus the, the normalized one. So three different definitions, three different ways of uh, getting rid of the problem. So what's the idea beyond that? Behind that, the idea is that uh, when you have a graph, the degrees, they drive the clustering. And in some sense, what you do with those normalization is try to remove a little bit this information to obtain clusters which are not driven by the degrees of the node. That's mainly the idea. 
Okay. Uh, remarks, uh, D is a diagonal matrix, so D minus 1 half and D minus 1, these are just the matrices with those elements, okay? And okay, this is for my students that they don't know that uh, taking a matrix A to the power uh, minus 1 half is not just taking the entries, minus 1 half, blah, blah, blah. Sorry for that. Uh, left multiplication by a diagonal matrix corresponds to multiplying the rows, uh, the row vectors, and right multiplication is multiplying the column vectors. So when you think of D minus 1 times A, that's the matrix whose rows are, uh, you take the rows of A and you divide it by the degrees, okay? And so, in, in the same way, D minus 1 half times A, you take the rows of A and you divide it by square root of the I. So, then, when you look at that, this is just the matrix where for each input, well, this was is the Google Translate thing, sorry for that, it's just AIJ a, divided by square root of the I and square root of the J. So you, you want to, the, the normalization of the, of the adjacency matrix is a way to take into account the different degrees of the nodes. Okay, let's look at uh, why is this useful. So one of the important things with this object is uh, the, that the spectrum uh, of these uh, matrices, they are connected with the connected components of the graphs and the number of connected components of the graphs. Wow, what is this, uh, <laughs> this thing? I think this is lower or equal lambda n. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Okay, so what happens is that uh, for the first two uh, Laplacian that are defined, they are real symmetric matrices. Okay, and that's why it was important that the values uh, A uh, were um, positive because, because the values of the adjacent matrix were positive. These, val these uh, matrices, they are real symmetric matrices uh, with uh, N positive real eigenvalues that you count with multiplicity. And so uh, you denote de them by lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda n. And the smallest one is 0 because if you look at the sum, so if I go back here, uh, I told you that the row sums of that uh, were equal to 0. And so that's the same for that one. So 0 is an eigenvalue because the row sums are equal to 0. So because 0 is, a, is an eigenvalue, and because I know that they have n positive real eigenvalues, 0 is the smallest. And maybe uh, lambda 2, the second smallest, maybe it's also 0. And when is it 0? In fact, so 0 is always an eigenvalue, and it's multi multiplicity as an eigenvalue. So the, how many of the lambdas are in fact equal to the 0 here? that's equal to the number of connected components uh, in the graph G. So this can be proved. It's like a very, very short proof. Um, this absolute uh, Laplacian, it's a bit different. In fact, you can prove that it has the same eigenvectors as Ln so the normalized one, but the eigenvalues are 1 minus the eigenvalues of, uh, of that ln, okay? So now these ones were between 0 and something uh, positive, and these ones, they are between, uh, so it's always positive, so... Yeah, something, uh, something not bounded uh, from below, and uh, at most one. So, okay, it's just um, a re... So, the, the, in fact, the eigenvalues are the same, but the eigenvectors uh, will be different. So, this is from connected components to clusters. 
So if we denote C1, CK, the connected components, so remember any graph can be decomposed into a unique set of maximal connected components. So I let C1 to CK denote the set of maximal connected components and 1 C1, 1 CK are the indicator vectors of the components. So what does that mean? Let me fix the IDs. So imagine I have these three connected components. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So the first connected co uh, component, I say, okay, this is that one, this is C1. And so 1, C1 is just the vector with size n, okay? And I put 1 here up to uh, the value uh, 5, and then zeros. And for um, C2, I put zeros here up to the value 5. Then I have ones up to the value uh, 9, and then zeros. Okay? So I can decompose the, the space uh, like that. Um, okay, so um, what does it say? Uh, blah, blah, blah. The eigenspace associated with the eigenvalue zero is generated by that. So if you have just one connected component, if the graph uh, has just one connected component, there's just one C and it's the vector of ones, okay? So then the eigenvalue is just generated by the, the eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue zero for those two matrices. It's just generated by one vector. It has dimension one. And so zero has multiplicity one only. In practice, uh, when we look at graphs with a single connected component, uh, in practice, we will look at graphs with a single connected component because if I have that type of object here on the blackboard, it's, uh, it's better to study all the connected components separately. In particular, if I want to find communities, which are uh, sets of nodes highly connected with the group and not, okay, then I will study the communities here and the communities here and the communities here, okay? So I'm not interesting, interested in that kind of object. So in practice, I will always look at a graph that is uh, connected and zero is an eigenvalue with multiplicity one and the associated eigenspace is generated by the vector of ones. So that's not very interesting. And the study of the spectrum brings nothing more here. But okay, that's not all, that's the first step only. So what you uh, need to uh, understand is that a community is almost a connected component in the sense that when I add um, these extra links, so I, I saw the communities, it's almost like if I add three connected components. This is not true, but this is linked. And so that's the information that the spectral clustering is going to capture. Okay? So how we will do that? So the spectral clustering consists on focusing on the first k eigenvectors. So when I say the first k, that means that I take the eigenvalues, I order them in increasing order, as I did like lambda 1, which is always 0, lambda 2, lambda 3, up to lambda n. And I look at the corresponding eigenvectors. So the first k ones are the ones that correspond to the smallest eigenvalues, the k smallest eigenvalues. This is awful, I'm really sorry, I should have read that. k smallest eigenvalues of L and Ln. And we, we will focus on that to find uh, the k communities. So 
beware. In LLN, it is the small eigenvalues which uh, contain the interesting information. Whereas, when we look at the absolute Laplacian, I told you that the eigenvalues of the La absolute Laplacian are 1 minus the eigenvalues of the uh, normalized Laplacian. So, in fact, we will see that the information that is carried out by this Laplacian, and that's why it's interesting, uh, we will look at the large eigenvalues in absolute value. So, that's completely different. You, you look at the large, uh, uh, the, the, the smallest ones, they correspond to the largest one for Ln, which we didn't look at uh, for Ln. And the largest one, they correspond to the smallest one in Ln, and these were, we, these were the ones we were focusing on. So, this will be, uh, for me, it's the most interesting uh, approach to work with this uh, uh, absolute uh, Laplacian, and I will explain why. So, it captures more information. And, okay, the, the eigenvectors that we look at, uh, they are different for the two type of Laplacian, either L and Ln on one type and uh, Laps uh, on the other type. So, at the, at the end, uh, the resulting uh, clustering, they will be different. Depending on the Laplacian that you choose, the, the eigenvectors will be a little bit different, even if there are links between the eigenvalues, and so the clustering will be different. Okay. Algorithm. So, we saw there are several ways of constructing the, the graph, but let's assume uh, the graph is fixed now. Then, you have several ways to define the Laplacian. And on top of that, there are several ways to define a clustering algorithm on a specific Laplacian. Okay, so many co possible combinations, and everyone claims uh, it has the better algorithm, the better technique, but that's normal. Okay. So, we will only see two different algorithms, a spectral uh, normali uh, uh, normalized spectral algorithm that uses Ln and the absolute spectral clustering that uses L apps. Okay, so we are not working with uh, the L, the classical uh, one. We are going to work with these two different Laplacian and each one has a specific uh, Cluster, uh, spectral clustering algorithm associated to it. So, in the following, A is the valued adjacency matrix of an undirected graph with positive uh, entries. So, the first one, the normalized spectral clustering by these authors, I've put the reference at the end. The input is that, uh, an adjacency matrix, so with positive entries, and uh, you should give the number of clusters. So, the spectral clustering algorithm is not able to select the number of clusters. We will see at the end how to choose uh, the number of clusters. There are heuristics to do so. But for the algorithm, you need to say, OK, I want this graph into three clusters. When I tell you it like that, by showing the, the graph on the blackboard, you say, OK, that's very easy. She plotted the graph, she saw uh, three different parts, and she decided to, to do the algorithm with uh, K communities. But in practice, you, you cannot plot the graph, because uh, as soon as it has uh, many nodes, you see nothing. So you have no idea of what to choose for K. But we'll see that uh, later. So you have to input the number of, of clusters that you want. And the output will be some clusters. How does it work? First, you calculate, you compute the normalized Laplacian. So I just show you. It's just uh, the adjacency matrix, and you have the diagonal of the degrees, but the degrees are just row sum of this adjacency matrix, and you multiply everything in, in a specific way that's easy to do. And if the matrix is very, very large, you encode it as a sparse ma matrix, and there are uh, libraries to handle um, the multiplications and, and etc. Uh, uh, matrix product of sparse matrix. So you this computation 
in the sparse matrix setting and that's efficient. <coughs> then you need to compute the k, the k eigenvectors associate, associated with the k smallest eigenvalues of Ln. So I have to admit that I never looked at uh, these functions of the spectral uh, decomposition, how they are implemented, but that's always very fast. So there are ways to do that in a very fast way. Even for a large matrix, you have um, you have functions implemented in any any kind of language in R that exists. You you do uh, the eigen decomposition of uh, of this matrix very very fast, very easily. Then you have to do these steps. You form the matrix U of size n times k, whose columns are the, the first k eigenvectors that you considered. So let me take this and I'm going here. So you, so you have the first eigenvector, it's an eigenvector uh, in dimension n. Okay, so it's something like that with dimension n. U2, it's also a vector with dimension n. And you go to UK. So you construct this matrix by just putting um, the, um, the, the columns uh, vectors uh, of the, the columns of the k first eigenvectors. And you choose, okay, I didn't mention it here, but uh, when, you, when you do this eigen decomposition, most of the times the eigenvectors that are outputted by uh, the, those type of function, they are normalized, okay? Because you could always multiply uh, the, the, the thing, but these are normalized. So as vectors in uh, N, they are normalized. And then, you form a second matrix of size n by k where you normalize the rows of u so that they have a Euclidean norm but in this dimension. So they were normalized in columns but then you normalize the rows. Don't ask me why. That's the way it is. It's cooking. No, but. No. no, 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 can't. Yeah, but that's a good question. So no, but okay. And then, so you you transform this to uh, into T, where no, the rows are normalized, but the columns are not normalized anymore. N by K. And then uh, you do K means you run K means on the rows of this matrix. So K means uh, will uh, group rows that are very similar. I think I have a, might have a picture, otherwise I'll draw a picture of, uh, of the idea be, behind that. And so you, 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 you have objects here and you cluster them into K groups. So in the K means algorithm, you input the value that you want K clusters. It's a K means with K clusters. Ah, oh, sorry for that. Uh, this was my sign to say, okay, from, from there I need to translate the French to English. And I hope I did. <laughs> I hope. Let's cross the figure. But at least this one is in English. So um, the absolute spectral clustering is a bit different. It starts the same way. You have this matrix, uh, n, size, uh, n by n. Uh, symmetric with positive entries. I should have added symmetric. You input the number of clusters and you output the clusters uh, which form a partitioning of the set of nodes. So now instead you compute the absolute Laplacian, so a formula a little bit different. Then you compute the first k eigenvectors associated to the k largest eigenvalues in absolute value. So now you take, uh, so remember, um, ta -ta -ta -ta. Uh, 
remember that we had L uh, N, it had uh, lambda 1 N, say, equals 0, lambda 1, well, maybe I put Ln, like it's the, it's the eigenvalue, lambda N Ln. So here I concentrated on the k smallest, and for L apps, in fact, uh, so I can write uh, on the end apps, and this corresponds, we say, to 1 minus, so this is the same as 1 minus lambda n ln, 1 minus lambda n minus 1 ln, etc., up to 1 minus lambda 1 ln. So if I look closely at these things, here I look at the k smallest, but now, so this is 1, 0 is somewhere here, but I don't know where, okay? So 0 is somewhere here. And I look at the largest in absolute value here. So this corresponds partly to those. And I also look at some here. So I have two parts. I don't know how many in each of the parts. Some of these will be among these. But maybe uh, all the largest in uh, absolute values, they are all negative. I don't know because I don't know where the zero is, you see? So that's completely different in spirit. We, we are not looking at the same thing. Okay, anyway, so you take the k largest eigenvalues in absolute value, then you form the matrix U uh, whose columns are U1, UK, so the same as before, like that, but without that, and then you don't normalize the rows. So you don't do that step. And you cluster the n rows with k means, with k clusters. OK. OK, let me try to explain this a little bit. Yeah, k means with uh, it's a bit tricky because k means is the name of the algorithm and you have to specify the number of clusters and use it with k which is the same as the number of eigenvalues uh, that I have selected or eigenvectors and this is the number of partitions I want to obtain at the very end. Okay? So let me try to give the, the flavor of, uh, of these things. Um, okay, so if, if you want to create k plus 1, take k plus 1 eigenvectors. So if you want to create 10 clusters on your set of nodes, then you take 10 eigenvectors. You have to choose carefully the, the most informative ones. And when you have these 10 eigenvectors, you cluster them into 10 groups. That's the idea. Yeah, yeah. So that's important. The number of eigenvectors we select is exactly the number of clusters uh, that we look for on this matrix. Wait, I will try to explain. Um, I will try to explain. Okay, um, let me see if it's written here, otherwise I'll do a... Uh, okay, so one of the, of the ideas of spectral clustering is that you take uh, the observations that were or originally you had uh, like vectors in RP you constructed a similarity 
measure between them and uh, you embed this into a new set that lives in RK. You have done a projection. When looking at this matrix, you have done a projection of your initial data points into the vector space of the K uh, initial eigenvectors that you are uh, selected. Okay, um, so the properties of the Laplacian matrices, they imply that this new set is easily clustered into K groups. And the K groups obtain, they tend to form communities, which are groups of nodes with a high within group connection probability, blah, 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 and weak between group connection probability. Okay, maybe I will discuss that after the, the picture. So, what I can try to explain with my hands, really uh, informal, but this is the way I see it. So, forget about the, the Laplacian and concentrate on the adjacency matrix, okay? The Laplacian is just a normalization of this matrix. If you look, if you have communities in the graph, that means that by reordering the rows and the columns of the matrix, I should see patterns like that. Large number of connections within that group, maybe here a smaller group with large number of connections, then another group with large number of connections, and then a last group with large number of connections. And here I have connection, but less. What you do on this matrix or on its normalized version is that you do spectral decomposition. So spectral decomposition uh, is a diagonalization of this matrix. So what you do by taking the K um, looking, so for instance, so, so the, 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 the information of the communities here, it's encoded into the eigenvectors that describe the different eigenspace of this matrix. And um, I told you that when we had C1, CK, which were the maximal connected components, in fact, uh, C, the, the eigenspace of, um, of uh, say, CJ was generated by, um, how, how was it, um, indicator, sorry, I have to, to cheat, uh, I don't know, I, I expect, yeah, 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 the indicator, the eigenspace associated, oh yeah, okay, so it's, it was uh, the eigenspace uh, for, the, for the eigenvalue zero, it was generated by one C1 up to one CK, okay? And what will happen very, very informally huh, with, uh, with the ends is that uh, now if you have almost uh, connected components, when you look not eigenspace of uh, zero. When you look at the small eigenvalues, then uh, this uh, eigenspace, so eigenspace of small eigenvalues, you should think of it as not far from being generated by the eigenvectors of C1, CK, where now these are the communities. Communities. Okay? So now, if the matrix U that I construct, it's more or less, okay, one community, it's not that, but it's almost that. It's like, the, um, the eigenvector will be supported. So the eigenvector for this will be supported mostly on the first components, and then I will have almost zero. Then the second eigenvector will be here, this size. 
is here, I have uh, values, and then I have zeros, etc. So when I look at that, then I do so. Let me write a third one. Here I have zero, then I have my, my third uh, community, and then the zeros. And the last one was up to there, and here I have something, okay? So now, if you see that the, the signal is carried like that, when you do k-means on the rows, it's obvious. Okay, and here I reordered everything so that you can see, but in practice, the nodes are not in the correct order, but the signal is the same. You see? So that's really uh, the idea behind the spectral clustering. And so the... Okay, so, so spectral clustering should capture communities. Um, in fact, it captures a little bit more than communities, but it's difficult to explain, so I won't. And um, absolute spectral clustering, uh, it's nice because it finds not only communities, but it finds, it finds also bipartite or disassertative structures. What are disassertative structures? It's when you tend to connect rather with not your group. So you connect rather outside of your group. So here you have signal outside the, bl the block diagonals. And this can be uh, captured by uh, absolute spectral clustering. You have both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in fact, uh, the, the absolute captures both. You, so the, the, this thing will be captured by uh, this, and so this will be the uh, largest eigenvalues of L apps, and this thing will be captured by the part that you don't look at in the other uh, Laplacians, which will be the smallest for L apps, which do correspond to the largest of Ln that you don't look at. So that's really interesting, the, the fact that you, you capture more with that. Okay, that's almost all I can explain <laughs> on spectral clustering, and we will test it tomorrow. Some practical comments to, to finish this. In practice, you see that there are many, many things to deal with. It's not easy at all. First, if you don't start with a graph, but you start with a classical data set, you have to choose the similarity. Um, so then there's a difference between epsilon neighborhood and k nearest neighborhood. Uh, so the, the difference between epsilon neighborhood and k nearest neighborhood, you can think of it as the first, uh, which one? The first one being a local adaptation to the neighborhood. Meaning that in the epsilon neighborhood, you, you don't fix the number of neighbors. So if nobody is around you, so for instance, if I'm here and I set a threshold, maybe I won't consider anyone. But if I fix uh, the, my k nearest neighbors, then I will look at my k nearest neighbors, even if I'm a little bit apart. So it's really uh, this idea of local adaptation of the size of the neighborhood. I have to rephrase it, so this, sorry for that. Um, so neighborhood sizes are different depending on the regions of the space. In the, in the space where you don't have uh, many data points, uh, with k nearest neighbor, you will uh, go uh, further, but with epsilon neighborhood, you will consider, okay, this is empty. Uh, mutual, so what I call a mutual k nearest neighbor is when you use the end rule. So you want me to be your neighbor and you to be my neighbor so that we have a connection. In mutual k nearest neighbor, you tend to connect uh, uh, points in regions of constant density. Uh, but you don't connect uh, closed regions together because uh, of, whew, sorry, but does not connect closed regions to them, but of density different. Okay, uh, that's awful. I, I will rephrase this. 
when I'm clear-minded uh, and it will be readable and understandable. I hope, I'm sorry for, for that mess. Um, and last thing, k nearest neighbor graphs are easier to handle than Gaussian similarity graphs, which are dense, in fact they are complete. So it's preferable to look at a discrete, uh, not, not completely dense uh, graph, uh, but you lose information when you have those thresholding steps. So you can have most, yeah, okay, that's, that's an important point. When, when you change the threshold, you can have more connected uh, components than the desired number of clusters. And so you, you, you lose uh, a lot of things. So if you, if you want to do K clusters, but you start by constructing a similarity and the threshold that you take is too large and the graph is completely disconnected, then you cannot find the K cluster because you already have too many disconnections. So this is a little bit uh, the, the problem to be aware of. Uh, there are um, uh, empirical recommendations to choose the, the parameters. When you look at uh, k nearest neighbors, you should, you should. It's recommended that you take k of the order of log n. Um, and, uh, and in any case, you must look at uh, the graph you have obtained and how many connected components it has. And if it's too uh, disconnected, then you should uh, change the value of the K or the value of the threshold, etc. cetera. Uh, when you use the epsilon neighborhood, uh, the recommendation is to choose a threshold such that the graph is connected. So maybe the, the smallest threshold you, you can find, but don't try them all, huh? it's empirical. And there is no rule for choosing the value sigma in the Gaussian similarity. You remember uh, the Gaussian similarity, you, you defined it as exponential minus the Euclidean distance between the two points divided by the sigma. And the sigma is really the, the shape of the Gaussian. So if sigma is small, you're putting uh, most of the, of the weight to small distance. And if it's large, then you're uh, dividing the weight onto uh, larger distances. Um, okay, one important point is the, the number of connected components. So if the graph has p connected components, then the eigenspace associated with the eigenvalue zero has always dimension p, and it's generated by the cluster indicators. However, the output of a spectral decomposition algorithm is any orthogonal basis of eigenvectors of this space. And so it's not necessarily the basis of the indicator vectors. So if you want to, to check this on, on practice, maybe you won't see it, okay? Because uh, there are many different uh, representation bases for the same eigenspace. So be careful of that. Um, but uh, if you if you do a k means uh, on output, then you'll find easily the the clusters because they they really have that information. So there's no problem about that. Okay, now an important point before we finish: How do we choose the number of eigenvectors, the the value of the k? So. The choosing the, the number of clusters, that's uh, a big problem in clustering, uh, in clustering uh, issues. It's recurrent. You, you always need to, to have a way to choose it. Uh, and here, you don't have a, a probabilistic model. You, have, you don't have anything like that. So you cannot rely on a criterion, on a probability, probability, probability based criterion like BIC or anything of, of that type. But there are ad hoc uh, criteria, uh, uh, blue, blue, blue. Okay, the, the common technique is to use the heuristic eigenvalues all. What does that mean? You look at the, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian that you have chosen. And so um, if you are lucky, they should be like that. So here, you just put the index 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 n. 
And here you just put lambda i for the different values of i. So the first eigenvalue is zero. If you have a connected uh, graph, the second eigenvalue is not zero and it's larger. And then you have the uh, uh, and maybe at some point, uh, sorry, like that. So this is maybe at some point you have a gap. Okay, so you look at the differences lambda i plus one minus lambda i, and you take the argmax over i of these differences. This is the largest gap or the, the all in the eigenvalues. And so uh, people take k as the argmax of this. And we'll see uh, in, the, in the practical session tomorrow that if you indeed create graphs which are uh, made of communities, quite clear communities, then you'll see the all appear. Okay. Uh, the choice of the Laplacian, uh, to choose which, which Laplacian matrix to use, it's recommended to look at the degree distribution. If it's homogeneous, so more or less all the, the edges, uh, all the nodes have the same degree, so the choice of the Laplacian has little impact on the result. But now it's our third theoretical session and you know that the degrees are not homogeneous. In real graphs, we see ups. So there are nodes with uh, I degree. So you should read this on the other way. It tells you, okay, the choice of the Laplacian has an impact. So try many of them. I like the absolute uh, Laplacian because it captures also the disassertative uh, communities and not only the, the communities, also the disassertative behavior. And that's all. Okay. So, see you tomorrow. Do, do you, are there any questions? No? Okay. So, see you tomorrow for the last session. Yeah? Oh. So, so, this is Louvain algorithm. This is Newman given modularity. This is uh, the original spectral clustering algorithm. It's the first one I showed you. And this is the absolute uh, one. So if you're more computer science, you should read that one. If you're more statistician, you should read that one. But maybe you could read both. I ah, know there's something. Uh, OK, I will add. Uh, I will add a reference because wh what is that? Uh, sorry. No, I have to clean all that. That's a, that's a mess. Wow, wow, that's a mess. No, that's a mess. This is an old. Uh, okay, I will add. Uh, um, there's a very nice um, um, review by. I don't know her name, but I know only her. So I put, uh, so, so everything you need to know about spectral clustering, in fact, all the things I, I'm saying here, they are mostly copy paste for, from that paper uh, on uh, the offer view on, on the spectral clustering. I'll put it very clearly in the notes. I'll update that uh, tonight. Okay. And uh, only one last question. I'd like to see if you have a reference, but maybe we can talk later. On the um, random walks methods. Ah, uh, I don't, but I can search for you. Okay. Because I never looked very closely at that. that. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So, see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao. Ciao.